good to be with you all uh, this morning. Uh, and thanks, uh, Brooks, uh, Christian, and uh, everyone else from MAPC for hosting this amazing event. Um, that was a wonderful video. I think it really drives home a lot of the key points that uh, will come up, I, I'm sure, uh, in, in the three days that, that we're convening here together. Uh, I'm Jamal Lewis. Again, I'm with the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. And you know, if you're not familiar with Green and Healthy Homes Initiative, uh, our mission is to uh, advance uh, racial and health equity uh, by increasing access to healthy housing. And we do that in a, a number of different ways, as, as you'll hear. Uh, and I won't read through all of this, um, but you, you, slides will be sent, I believe, so you'll have access to that. Uh, here, here is uh, where uh, we work. Uh, so we work in a number of different areas across the country. And uh, as Brooks mentioned, our main goal is to increase access to uh, safe, healthy, energy efficient and affordable housing. And we do that in a number of ways. One, by providing direct services. So we administer uh, healthy housing programs, including lead poisoning prevention, uh, asthma, trigger reduction, aging in place, uh, and energy efficiency and weatherization. Uh, and we also do a lot of policy and program design and implementation to help improve uh, those programs and expand access uh, to uh, folks who don't uh, typically have access to those programs. So I'm going to start uh, by grounding us a little bit um, and going even maybe even deeper than the video. Um, introduce a concept that some, many of you may already know, uh, but it's, it's energy insecurity, it's the inability of, of households to meet their basic energy needs. Uh, and that can manifest in, in a number of different ways. Uh, there's the economic manifestation, so just purely being unable to, to afford your energy every month. Uh, there's physical, so there's having leakages or structural deficiencies that cause us to have to use more energy in order to, to heat our home or cool our home, uh, which then makes it uh, more expensive uh, to, uh, to heat and cool our homes. And then there's the behavioral, which was covered a little bit in the video, and that is intentionally uh, choosing not to use energy in order to save money, which can then uh, cause harm. So, you know, that can manifest in, in situations like, you know, choosing to heat your home with your stove instead of the heating system because it might be a little cheaper or, uh, or choosing not to heat your home, even if it's cold, um, which can also manifest in, you know, some health outcomes. Uh, and this, this data, uh, one in three households that are currently in energy insecure is a few, few years old, actually. And that, that number probably, or that statistic is probably even worse now, um, considering that we're in a global pandemic and a lot of people have remained at home, which means their, their home utility bills are, are likely higher than they were before. So what, what impact does that have? Uh, there's thermal discomfort. Uh, there's purely just being cold or being too hot uh, in the in the winter and the summer, respectively. Uh, they're you know poor indoor air quality. If if your furnace or boiler uh, isn't efficient and you know emits uh, uh, air pollution, uh, there's you know trade-offs. You know having to constantly you know every month uh, decide between paying your rent or your mortgage and paying your utility bill, uh, or even paying your uh, paying for food or paying for your, your medicine. So there's a lot of uh, issues and impacts that, that can result from, from those decisions. And there's a lot of psychological effects of, of that too. Um, the constant stress, uh, and if you're experiencing energy insecurity over a long period of time, you know, that can be a, a really significant amount of stress that can cause you know, chronic illnesses later in life. Uh, I'm going to, again, in addition to the video, ground us in, uh, I'm going to read one of these quotes, and I won't read both. I'll read, the, I'll read the bottom one. That furnace was in there since the house was built. It was one of those old-fashioned furnaces that looks like an octopus with all the ducts everywhere. It needed to be replaced 
and I called the heating cooling person. He had gotten it to run before, but then he said there was nothing he could do for it this time. He said I should find me another house to live in or buy another furnace, which would probably cost $10,000. That's when I started using my stove to have a little heat. That's from an African-American Detroit resident inter interviewed in 2018. And that is uh, an example that many, uh, many people around the country are facing at this point. So uh, this, this issue of energy insecurity is, is pervasive uh, and widespread uh, and organizations like uh, GHHI uh, and MAPC are fighting uh, to, to alleviate that issue. Uh, what are the other costs and what are the other issues in, in, in homes that impact our health? So there's om almost 9 million families that live in some form of unhealthy housing. Uh, they're, uh, the top issues that, that we deal with are lead poisoning, which I, I'm sure that many of you ha have some idea about lead's a neurotoxin uh, that was present in paint before 1978. So any home that was built before then likely will have some lead paint in their home. And that can cause lifetime uh, damage to, to children's brains, um, leading to behavioral issues and uh, you know, poor, poor functioning. Uh, the other issue with, with housing uh, is the presence of things like mold, uh, pest infil infiltration, uh, air, in, or air, air pollution uh, that can exacerbate uh, asthma and other respiratory illnesses. Uh, and then uh, we're, we're finding that uh, a lot of our, our older, uh, older adults are uh, more inclined to age in place in their own homes uh, instead of going to things like nursing homes and, and assisted living facilities. Uh, but the homes that, uh, that currently exist are, are, are not as safe as they could be uh, for someone's age in place. And so we do a lot of work to improve, improve the conditions and the quality of housing uh, so that our older adult neighbors can do that. The burden is significant. Over 14 million missed school days and over 14 million missed work days happen because of people with asthma having to take time off. Um, as was mentioned in the video, uh, low and moderate income uh, families often spend more as a percentage of their income, which we'll talk a little bit more about on their energy bills uh, than other households. And that can result in really significant costs. As you see at the bottom, we're talking about over $100 billion in taxpayer funding spent to, uh, that is spent to address some of these issues that are entirely preventable. We can prevent someone from going to the hospital or the ER room uh, for an asthma exacerbation that's being caused by mold in their home. We can prevent that. We can prevent lead poisoning by getting rid of the lead in our homes. Uh, and the inability or the lack of, of us doing that <clears throat> is, causing, is causing us money on the back end. That burden is not distributed equally. And as you heard from the video, there are certain, uh, there are certain groups of us that have a disproportionate impact. The video talked about low and moderate income households and it talked about uh, uh, black and brown households, uh, but there's likely more. Um, but today I'm just gonna focus on one aspect of, uh, of those disproportionately impacted and that's uh, African-Americans. Studies show uh, that African-Americans are, are more likely to experience things like evictions, foreclosures, uh, and are more likely to, uh, to experience other, uh, uh, to live in other transient uh, forms of housing. Uh, you know, we often pay more as a percentage of our income on, uh, on housing than other groups. And, and that's because of, for a lot of reasons, but because we've often traditionally and historically had less access to housing. So the housing that was available to us, uh, we had to pay more for uh, because there was less of it. There's also research uh, by good friends, uh, Ariel and Lauren Ross, uh, Ariel Jehovah and Lauren Ross at ACEEE uh, that have done a lot of research on energy burden, which I know will be, will be covered a little bit more later. Um, but African-Americans have been shown to pay more of their income on energy compared to other groups. 
And then this idea of bundle burdens and economic trade-offs was talked about in the video as well. It's the, it's the idea that in order to, uh, that every month there's a decision to make about where our, where our income or where our disposable income will go. Will it go towards housing, food, medicine, um, kids, energy? And African-Americans uh, are, have been shown to, to, to face that decision more often uh, than, than other groups. There's also health burdens. Uh, we have the, the lowest quality or the lowest life expectancy uh, of any other group. Um, and we experience uh, chronic conditions like hypertension, uh, heart disease, uh, stroke. Uh, we just experience some, you know, those uh, health issues at higher rates than other, than other groups. And then we talk about extreme weather and climate impacts, which is becoming increasingly more salient. Um, think about areas of the South, which I know Catherine will talk about. Um, there are uh, communities of color that occupy, uh, you know, often the most vulnerable uh, areas when it comes to extreme weather uh, and, and climate change. And even, even more, because uh, we're just getting off the heels of summer, uh, there's there are na entire neighborhoods that don't have access to AC, and we're finding that those neighborhoods are often the same neighborhoods that are experiencing these other issues. Uh, and then I'll talk about the last thing I'll talk about uh, is this concept of the resilience reserve, and that is uh, a uh, a concept that is is meant to describe our ability to respond uh, to uh, extreme events. So if if something extreme happens in my life, I have a certain amount of, of resilience in me to be able to respond to that. If, and if I keep getting hit with things over and over again, my ability to respond to those incidents uh, will reduce. Um, and there's research out there suggesting that uh, as it relates to energy, uh, energy and security, uh, that African-Americans typically have less uh, resilience reserve to be able to respond to some of these issues. So what, uh, why is this the case? Um, so we're, research shows and we're finding that uh, the need for things like energy efficiency, uh, which, which can manifest in, in many different ways through insulation, uh, more efficient appliances, um, the need for those solutions uh, is uh, disproportionately exist uh, in, in these same communities uh, that have a disproportionate impact. And that's you know in part because of the racist and discriminatory housing policies that have existed for, or that that uh, that were in place uh, for generations, and that have led to one clusters of of individuals and communities um, that have that have received uh, disproportionately less resources in order to properly maintain uh, their homes and even move to newer homes, uh, as was evident through the video. And so the, the, uh, the impact of uh, residential segregation and the lack of access to things like loans has led to the, the current situation that we're in now, which is there are a lot of communities uh, that uh, are living in, a lot of residents that are living in communities uh, that receive less resources and thus, uh, th their homes are uh, in uh, that are their homes are substandard. So there's um, presence of health and safety hazards like lead. Um, there's more moisture intrusion, which leads to things like mold and mildew. And all of these uh, issues uh, have direct health impacts, as we talked about, uh, but also prevent access to think to to these critical programs that can be helpful. Uh, so when we talk about energy efficiency, we, we often you know group it into buckets. There's building shell measures, so that's like in, you know air sealing and insulation, so that the air inside can stay inside. So if you're heating your home, the heat stays inside. Uh, and then there's cosmetic measures like you know replacing stove or replacing refrigerator, um, but but don't have uh, the type of impact in terms of thermal comfort and, and of these some of these other opportunities. Um, and we're often pushing for building shell measures, but efficiency programs won't actually perform that if there's mold in the home. 
we don't want to do that because we're we we, we would be sealing in the mold uh, which would then be even worse it could actually kill someone so these programs will defer uh, these resources until the mold can be addressed and what we know about uh, these you know, the people who live in these homes is that is that they're already limited with their incomes. So how are they gonna get this mold or some of these other issues addressed? Um, and that is ever more important as we are looking to transition to a clean energy economy. There are a lot of people who won't be able to benefit from, uh, from that transition because of you know, the substandard conditions and quality of, of the homes that we live in. So what can we do about that? Uh, and it's my last slide before I kick it to Catherine. Um, GHHI, we work to uh, ensure that there are plenty of resources available, not only to do things like air sealing and insulation, but to address lead, to address mold, to address asbestos, and some of these other health and safety issues um, that have direct health impacts, but also prevent access to critical programs. And what we, what we found is that when we do that, when we take that comprehensive approach, um, a plethora of benefits can accrue, not only to the household and the individual, but to communities uh, or entire uh, states. Um, and so I'll stop there and I'll, I'll kick it to, to Catherine. And Catherine, I'll just advance your slides for you. Awesome, thanks so much, Jamal. Um, so I'm gonna talk about, um, I, I think a, a way in which GHHI has been, we've had a great opportunity here in the state of Mississippi to apply some of this framework um, uh, work that Jamal has developed in his research uh, to come up with cohesive strategies that will help, help support communities that want to address um, equity building needs through housing and uh, development and revitalization of housing that is healthy and safe and energy efficient but are not sure where to start because all of these services are so siloed. Um, it seems so complex to, um, you know, figure out a way to pull together these different threads to all be moving in the same direction. And that's, you know, been true here in the state of Mississippi, um, but is I would say true in, in most communities where we work across the country. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that in context of um, some research that uh, we've been leading and, um, you know, we'll talk about some of the kind of broader applications of that as we close out. Um, Jamal, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so just a quick um, explanation of, of what exactly I'm talking about. We had a partnership with the Mississippi State Department of Health over the past year to complete a healthy um, housing, what we called a healthy housing policy project, but followed a, um, a, a process um, mostly informed by like the health impact assessment um, framework. Uh, to identify um, strategies for reducing hazards in housing in seven communities across the state of Mississippi that impact health and finding um, strategies through education, planning, workforce training, fundraising, and local policy development and implementation that was feasible for communities. So we're talking about, you know, property maintenance, code enforcement, um, you know, uh, lead assessment requirements, you know, other things along those lines for, um, you know, de developing those strategies that small towns and um, under-resourced cities could implement, but also, you know, approaching this with equity in mind to ensure that we were working on things that wouldn't be um, creating adverse effects to community residents and displacing people and, and those things. And um, you could go to the next slide, Jamal. Um, so our, our motivation for working on this um, and, and what we knew we were getting into is that we have significant um, uh, uh, measures around what the impact of unhealthy, unsafe housing are and inefficient housing in the state of Mississippi, um, but are not, we have not over the years connected these surveillance issues to um, actions when it comes to housing policy at the state level. So we know we have a high level of risk for um, childhood exposure to lead-based paint. We know that we have a high rate of um, people who were getting injured because of their housing, you know, having trip and fall injuries, fires, those sorts of things. And we have a very high rate of asthma prevalence. And we know that there are health, you know, there are racial disparities and um, disparities by household income across all of these issues. 
And um, you can go to the next slide. Let's see. I fix the next. Okay. Then one additional thing I'll say about that is we also know based on medical cost data, we're spending over a billion dollars a year to treat people who are sick. And that money is money that is not being reinvested in communities to build up our housing and our infrastructure and sustain. Um, so it's a, a big part of what GHHI works to do is figure out how we can invest in communities, address those environmental health factors, social determinants of health, so we can avoid unnecessary you know, medical cost spendings um, in, um, uh, in our inefficient systems as they are now. So just wanna give you an idea of kind of where we were working and that we were working across um, our you know, capital city, Jackson, um, some other kind of, you know, Hattiesburg is this town of about 3,000 people. Um, but most of the places where we were working were small towns and in, you know, small towns within rural areas. And we also were able to work with the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, which is in um, kind of central East Mississippi um, in the Philadelphia area. So um, we really got a diverse um, level of engagement on these issues and um, conversations. And I think you'll see that reflected in our findings. And Catherine, um, we are a little behind time. So if I could ask you to maybe hustle through in five minutes or so. That would be great. Yeah, so we have um, Jamal, in that case, um, go to the next slide and I just kind of talk through these activities so you can see what I'm talking about. So um, you know, what I wanted to share with, with this audience in particular is um, you know, just a couple of things and then we'll move on um, that we, um, through this process and doing the health impact assessment process and really um, taking, I think, what Jamal has been able to develop with um, the equity measurement framework, um, particularly for energy efficiency, but here we've applied it to, um, to health and housing issues, but looking at the historical legacies that created the current um, uh, status quo for housing quality and, um, and maintenance issues, and started that conversation and were able to lay out a narrative that really began in the 1930s um, where we had the National Housing Act um, of 1934 and then 1937 and uh, kind of laid out how that the federal funding and requirements of housing programs were applied locally. So, you know, I think a lot of people are already familiar with how that happened with um, homeownership finance and the redlining maps and how that created racial segregation. Um, but also things like, um, you know, where public housing was being located and who had access to public housing. And um, also looking at, you know, when we were getting big investments of federal dollars in the 1940s and 50s, what kind of issues were being addressed with that? And, you know, the image here is a layout of a um, housing assessment that was done in 1940 that showed where infrastructure, um, basic infrastructure was still really needed in the state of Mississippi. Um, and, you know, again, from the beginning, we saw that there were disparities in how that, um, how people had access to future resources. And you know, that was really moving forward solidified in the 1970s, you know, where then, um, you know, Congress started to pull back from funding public housing um, everywhere in, in the, you know, in the state of Mississippi, of course. Um, but there uh, was just a more and more investment in home ownership at that point and less and less in renter housing. But we have already created these huge divides in our stock. Um, so go to the next slide, Paul. And, um, you know, so laying out that story and that narrative, I think helped create this, the connections we were looking for um, across sectors on, you know, the relationships of health, um, housing quality, affordability, and also energy efficiency. And um, that told a story around the data that we have about these disparities today and why we have over 300,000 households that are cost burdened in the state of Mississippi. And that are, they, we know that those are the households that we need to um, engage in coming up with solutions because they are the ones experiencing expo exposures to unhealthy housing conditions, energy cost burdens, and the other things that um, next slide, Jamal. Um, yeah, and this is, you know, what, what I kind of already laid out in terms of investments. You know, we just have um, a way more subsidies into homeownership um, when we look across federal programs at this point in rental housing. And this is a fact sheet, um, yeah, that, that is available to every state, but one that we pulled from the, the state of Mississippi from the Center um, on Budget and Policy Priorities. You can go ahead, Jamal. Um, so just to round this out, 
you know, what we found when we got into communities and did focus groups and surveying um, is all these trends are still happening on the ground and what communities are prioritizing um, is a combination of, of health and energy issues when it comes to what the needs are in their, their housing units itself. Um, you know, households are recognizing that their energy bills are too high and unaffordable, that their windows are leaking air, that they also have mold and dampness issues, chipping and peeling paint, and that they don't have carbon monoxide detectors and, and they're concerned about the needs for all of these different um, uh, things in their house units. And, um, next slide. And, um, and expanding this out to neighborhood quality, just as that was an interesting finding that there are still a lot of environmental health issues you know, related to that. So the kind of outside the envelope issues with um, the frequency of natural disasters, dealing with flooding, you know, is all interconnected in people's minds and you know, which just again proves that we really have to um, pull together a collective strategy to, um, to shore up neighborhoods where people are and um, so they can uh, address all these issues in tandem. Next. So, you know, what we talked about in fo our focus groups and, um, you know, I think is the opportunity for, for all the communities where GHHI is working is to think about how we can transition policy. Um, and, you know, we talked through some of the issues that we see pictured here that, um, you know, our policies have created these, op these issues where people are exposed to unsafe conditions. Um, and when they try to take action, they're vulnerable to eviction and displacement and they're economically insecure. And we really just need to replace those with policies that are enabling housing repairs, um, improvements to health, safety and efficiency and affordability. And um, we need to find ways that the, we can um, address those issues head on at the local level and support that. So I'll just wrap up by saying, um, you know, this was an opportunity for us to, to lay out these um, you know, again, this narrative of how we, how we got here, but also create a new narrative of how we can get to something better. Um, and that is something, I think that's an opportunity for all of us. And um, it takes time, obviously, to get um, this kind of, um, you know, collective approach organized. And it's something that is changing very rapidly now with a new influx of federal funding. Um, but um, Jamal, if you want to go to my um, last slide, I'll just show these were the you know barriers that we highlighted in our research we created a policy platform around this that was really addressing all of the needs for cohesive strategy development engagement of our public service commission and our housing finance agencies um, trainings for workforce and frontline uh, people as well as residents and also um, coordinated um, financial investments um, so i will um you know, just end there, and I think Jamal and I will um, hope to talk more about that in our um, our, uh, our time for uh, uh, group discussion of you know what are some kind of uh, future pathways to get um, to address these issues. And thank you so much.